Good afternoon, buenos dias, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Scott Carney and Jason Micklian to discuss The Vortex, a true story of history's deadliest storm, an unspeakable war and liberation published by our friends at ECHO. The Vortex is NPR's book of the day today, so congratulations. Scott Carney is an investigative journalist and anthropologist, as well as the author of the New York Times bestseller, What Doesn't Kill Us. He spent six years living in South Asia as a contributing editor for Wired and writer for Mother Jones, NPR, Discover Magazine, Fast Company, Men's Journal, and many other publications. His other books include The Red Market, The Enlightenment Trap, and The Wedge. He is the founder of Foxtopus Inc., a Denver-based media company. Co-author of The Vortex is Jason Micklian, a senior researcher at the Center for Development and Environment at the University of Oslo. Micklian has published over 60 academic and policy works on issues of conflict and crisis based on extensive fieldwork in Bangladesh, Colombia, India, and the Congo. He serves on the United Nations Expert Panel on Business and Human Rights, has won several awards for his academic publications, and serves as an expert resource for various government knowledge banks in the US, UK, EU, and Norway. Just a quick reminder that throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and please order your copy of The Vortex from Books and Books and support independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual screen. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, uh, Books and Books, for having me and, uh, and Jason, who is incredibly blurry right now. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. And I, you know, again, I'm Scott Carney, the author of The Vortex with Jason Michelin, who's the author of The Vortex. We are The Vortex authors. Uh, I am an investigative journalist and anthropologist, which means that I am really, um, you know, trained in telling sort of in-depth uh, stories with narrative arcs that sort of that, that get, you know, hopefully get intentions and capture the reader's attention. And Jason is, uh, you know, one a world-class academic uh, who, you know, out of Norway, and we have been friends for 20 years. Uh, and this is our first, you know, book together. Uh, and it, bega it began as sort of like a dream uh, almost six years ago. You know, there have been a lot of books about climate change and the imminent peril of our planet, but it has been hard uh, for many of these works to connect those abstract concepts to real uh, lived experiences, right? We know that people respond to stories and the best way that we thought to get this message across uh, uh, about how climate change is affecting us all is through the vehicle of narrative nonfiction and to tell it, to tell the true story as, an, as a nonfiction action thriller. Uh, and, you know, we are just, I speak for Jason and I, uh, together, we are just absolutely beside ourselves that after all of this hard work, um, the book is now uh, going through a metamorphosis. It's no longer the thing that we are just lasered in on for, you know, for, you know, years at a time, but it's something that is now, uh, that we can give out to the readers. And it is such an honor to be able to speak with everyone here and, and sort of to start knowing how people react. And we are, again, thrilled <laughs> that we are an NPR's book of the day. You know, this is, it, it's a really difficult book to explain, um, you know, just through a title, right? You know, this is a, a, a like a, a story that goes back 50 years in a part of the world that a lot of people don't know about. And it's been our mission to tell how important this one event is to everything that we know about the world uh, right now, how it actually sort of formed the basis of a lot of our geopolitical um, 
uh, uh, situations uh, that we're living through right now. And for us, the story began, I mean, the way we heard about it, you know, as an investigative journalist, I'd been living in India for six years. Um, Jason has been going to India since 2001, I believe. I think that's when you, you started going, when he lived uh, for a year in Varanasi. I was in Chennai, which is a South Indian city. And, you know, I was writing stories about, um, about organ trafficking, about wars. We wrote stories about wars that were going on in central India. And uh, in 2001, we had decided to work on a story together about a border wall that India had built all the way around the 2,500 mile, or sorry, 2,500 kilometer border of Bangladesh. It was this fortification um, that, that, the leaders were ostensibly saying was about climate change. They were saying that, you know, Bangladesh is going to get hit by a storm and millions of people are going to cross our borders and we do not want that. It was sort it's sort of a similar logic as the border wall on the southern border of the of uh, of the United States. And you know the the actual story that we were telling was about this young girl who was shot on this border wall as she was trying to cross over uh, and it was a terrible thing that occurred but we wanted to know what was it that made india want to build a wall in the first place why was this even a good idea and it all traced back to what was the deadliest storm in human history that hit in 1970 in november and killed a half a million people uh, and, you know, so that's how we, that, that, that when we learned that, we we're like, we have to tell this story. And it just seems so unbelievably important that it's still reverberating right now. And I'll give this over to Jason so he can tell us a little bit about sort of the history of India and Pakistan, um, you know, a little refresher, since you may not be totally aware of it. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks, Christina, and everyone who's been able to join us today. Uh, I just reiterate what Scott said. It's such a pleasure, such an honor to be able to talk with you about our new book. And we're just so excited to say everything about it. Hopefully we can talk real fast and get it done in 30 minutes. Um, I will do the very boring history part now. Um, as Scott said, we have a narrative nonfiction book. We want the story to feel like you know an adventure and get across these very serious issues of climate change, uh, of the conflict and the relationship between the two. Um, but it's also good to start at you know at the beginning. And this is even before 1970. Uh, we're going back to 19. We don't do it this in the book, but we when we talk about the background, it really goes back to 1947, and that's when the British uh, gave up their colonial crown jewel of India. Now, when they did this the British decided it would be a good idea to split the country into Muslim majority and Hindu majority parts. And they, they called these two parts India and Pakistan. Now, the problem with this is that the Muslim majority parts were on the eastern western sides of India. So when they redrew the map, you had a situation where Pakistan was split into east and west and India was right in the center. There was about a thousand miles that separated the two. Now, East and West Pakistan being lumped together created other problems. Uh, the West Pakistan was where the political center was, and it was run by Urdu-speaking majority uh, Punjabis uh, and, and other ethnic groups, whereas the Eastern Pakistan was primarily Bengali-speaking. Uh, well, the, both, both of these two groups had the same religion. They didn't really share the same culture and had very different lived experiences. So over a generation of trying to keep these two parts of the country together, uh, what the West did is they started to use the East like their own little fiefdom, almost a colony within a colony. Uh, they took resources out of East Pakistan to spend on themselves. They gave very few resources back into the country. Uh, and over a period of about 20 years, uh, West Pakistan's wealth and importance grew, whereas East Pakistan just kept shrinking. Uh, now, the biggest issue was that there were actually more people in East Pakistan than the West. So this takes us up to 1970. And right before the cyclone strikes, uh, the president at the time, uh, Yahya Khan, who Scott will talk about a little bit, uh, decided it would be a magnanimous time to do the country's first ever free and fair election. Now, most people thought that the West would, uh, that the West Pakistan would win, uh, that it wouldn't be very close. But the potential was there. Uh, if the East had something to bring them all together, they could conceivably win the election. Yeah, and the, the thing about telling this story is, 
and 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 that sort of great moment that where where history could change, right? Is that we're trying to tell this through the eyes of the characters themselves, the people who are both um, playing geopolitical, uh, um, you know, pieces on that great chessboard of the Cold War, but also the individuals who are living through who actually become quite pivotal players in their own uh, in their own right, and. So Yahya Khan, the president of Pakistan, was coincidentally and, and, and through a, a strange series of, of, uh, of you know, unfortunate events, the uh, best friend of President Richard Nixon. Uh, you, know, in, 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 you know, there were several biographies that have suggested that Yahya Khan was actually uh, Nixon's best friend in the whole world, aside from one banker in uh, the Keys. And... Right before this storm happens, a few months before the storm, uh, Yahya uh, and Nixon meet up in Pakistan and Nixon has this request. He says, Yahya, I need to open up relations with China, something that became his you know, most precious and most wonderful um, geopolitical achievement. China had been closed to the world uh, since the Cultural Revolution and Nixon wanted to change all that. And Yahya Khan was the only man in the world who had connections to both Mao directly and to uh, Richard Nixon. So he was the vehicle for which all, all of those political um, machinations actually would happen. And, and Nixon said, I will give you basically anything you want if you do this. And Yahya Khan and Pakistan in general had been at sort of a cold war within a cold war within a cold war with India that just occasionally sparked into actual, you know, tank battles. And uh, about three years before this, um, he had led uh, a, a terrible military defeat against the Indian forces. Uh, Pakistan was smiting and they needed American weapons, American aircraft, American tanks, American bullets to, um, you know, assert themselves against the enemy of India. And, uh, and Nixon was more than happy to trade uh, the, the that that military materiel for these diplomatic relations, and uh, it it turns out that uh, the personalities of these two men were so well matched that that as one thing happens after another, you know, we we were on the cusp of this election and. And while Yahya is talking with Mao in China, this massive storm hits his colonial province of what is now Bangladesh and kills half a million people. And Yahya Khan is just so um, overwhelmed with his, you know, his diplomatic mission. Um, and also, incidentally, he was a raging dr alcoholic, not unlike um, President uh, Nixon. And he um, basically ignored all of the death, all of that chaos that happened because they were Bengalis. He just didn't care. He actually uh, flew an airplane a few days later over the whole region while he was drinking beer and throws his beer can out the, out the window and says, yeah, it doesn't look so bad. Uh, naturally, this is a big problem for uh, Bengalis who, who uh, are, have their whole families died uh, right in front of them. And it becomes one of these galvanizing points where we had all of these disparate Bengali factions, uh, you know, fighting against one another for a little scrap of the political pie to major leaders of, of, of uh, major Bengali leaders saying, look, I don't care about my own political fortunes. I'm going to throw it against this other, uh, behind this other leader so that all Bengalis unite together in an election that gets so, um, it goes so hard in favor of the Bengalis that it's the equivalent of in America, the Democrats winning 70% of the electorate. It's like this huge landslide against Yahya Khan. And Yahya Khan then decides that he's got all these weapons. He's got all of this um, material and he's got the backing of America so that he is going to start blaming the fake news media. He's going to start blaming all of these, um, uh, you know, he's going to make up conspiracy theories. And then he's going to try to flip the election by force of arms. Great, thanks, we, thanks, Scott. and um, yeah, and, and and of course, it it you know what we're presenting here is pretty much the background. Of course, Yahya and Nixon are two of the the main characters of the book, and we were lucky enough to get some tremendously rich uh, primary details and information on those two. 
But of course, to tell this story and to tell it in a way that is truly relatable, we also had to um, had to find other people whose experiences we could also share. And one of those is Muhammad Hai. Now, when the when the cyclone struck, Muhammad was uh, 19 years old. He was living in a in a small island called Manpura, which is basically at the very bottom of Bangladesh, right before the country goes into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, he was a student at the time. Um, he was a he was a fisherman along with his family. Uh, you know, just a, just an everyday average kid who was, you know, hoping one day to maybe go to university. Uh, he just had those 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 everyday dreams that, that people have. But there wasn't anything particularly uh, special about his life at the time. But when the storm hit, uh, this was this was something that it came into islands like Manpura uh, at midnight with almost no warning. Um the both Yahya Khan and India could have given these people the warning, uh, but they didn't. India, for political reasons, they didn't want to give anything to their enemy. And as Scott said, Yahya Khan just didn't care. Uh, so as the storm came, the storm surge went up higher and higher and higher. Uh, Muhammad Hai was in his house with 20 of his closest relatives. Uh, and over the course of the night, the water subsumed the entire house and Muhammad was actually the only one in his family to survive. And he did this by jumping first onto the roof and then onto a palm tree and hanging on for dear life as 120 mile an hour winds whipped against him for five straight hours. When the storm subsided, Muhammad, first of all, recognized that his entire family was dead. Uh, he was, of course, in shock. It was a, a tremendously powerful experience that uh, still haunts him to this day, of course. Uh, but he also looked around and he saw that his island of 50,000 people was almost entirely obliterated. Uh, of the 50,000 people, over 40,000 of them died that night. So he walked around the island. He was looking uh, for, for some sort of guidance, some sort of help. Uh, but all he found were people like himself who had barely survived the storm. Uh, the politicians had all either died or were sitting catatonic. Uh, no one was doing anything. So at this point, Muhammad said, I need to do something. I need to be the one who can help these people. And this brings in our other, another main character of ours, who is Cornelia Rohde. She was a Boston school teacher. And along with her husband, John, had moved to Bangladesh uh, just a couple years before. John was a doctor and they were trying to draft him into Vietnam. He used up a couple of his first excuses about, you know, bad heart, bad legs. None of those worked anymore because they were, you know, in Vietnam, uh, Americans were dying and they needed to replace them. So they figured out that Bangladesh or that East Pakistan at the time was one place where they could go into what they felt would be relatively safe, relatively free uh, to ride out Vietnam. Now, when the storm hit, Candy and uh, Cornelia and John were in the, the provincial capital of Dhaka. And the storm didn't hit the, the capital that much, but she also started to see some of these headlines. And she thought, uh, you know, if all these people are dying, they, they're going to need help as well. So along with her friends, she actually started the world's, uh, she started a relief agency. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, as Scott mentioned, Yahya Khan wasn't doing anything to help these people. But, but Cornelia was able to. So she actually engineered over a period of weeks what became the largest private relief aid organization uh, in history at that time. And that's how she met with Muhammad Hai, and then they became uh, aid workers together. And the book begins uh, on, you know, we're, again, we're trying to tell this through the eyes of the characters as much as possible. This isn't like dry history. This is when you when you you know, oh, read the first chapter, you'll see that you're right in the middle of like sort of epic scenes, viewing it from their their actual perspectives. And the uh, opening scene, or at least of the first chapter, is this guy named Hafezuddin Ahmad, who is the most popular, most famous soccer player in all of Pakistan. And he's a Bengali. His father is, a, is an important politician. And he is in front of these 20,000 screaming fans and they're facing off against the Soviet Union. Uh, he is in the national team. And uh, they, are, they are down uh, zero to one. And he's every he, and he, he's like I have to score before halftime. And as he's running towards the, the end, the uh, you know towards the the opposing uh, team's goal, uh, 
you know, the crowd is just beside themselves because they're all Bengalis and they're watching this Bengali player just, you know, crush it on the field. And as he kicks the ball to pass over to one of his Punjabi players, because it's the national team, it has both sides, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, staffing their 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 ranks, um, the crowd goes dead silent because they do not want to cheer for one of those Punjabis who are be, have been like colonial usurpers. And and it, this happens the whole game. It's like cheer, silence, cheer, silence. Uh, and eventually he scores that game tying goal. And it seems that there's this chance for this colonial underdog to actually be uh, a superpower. Uh, and um, but it's also very, I won't tell you how the game ends, um, but it's also Hafez's very last game that he is going to play. Um, and because his father, I get, again, I said he was a politician, um, really thinks that even if you're the Pele of Pakistan, that's not a real job. Because, you know, I don't know how many of you have parents. I do. Not always, they don't always love uh, what you're doing with your life. And they, they just couldn't see the greatness that was in Hafez. So Fez is sort of like downtrodden and he says, this is my last game ever. And he meets a major in the Pakistan military who says, you know what? You want a real job? You also want to play soccer? I have a solution for you. Play soccer for the army. Yeah, you know, we have this team that is terrible, but we play all over the world and we're trying to like not lose every game. So we need a ringer. And Hafez is like, that's actually sort of interesting. It's a real job. It's a steady thing. You know, you'll bring me in as a junior officer and I won't have to fight because you just want me to play soccer. Let's go. So he joins the military at, right before this storm ruins everything. Uh, and he actually gets posted to uh, military duty. Uh, cleaning up the thousands of dead bodies that take weeks to just simply bury. And uh, while he's doing that, he actually meets Yahya Khan and um, you know, insults him in a very colorful way, which you will read about in the book. Uh, and, then, um, and, then is, and then when this ticks forward and there's this horrible thing when after Yahya Khan decides that he has lost the election and then decides that I'm gonna use my military to retain power, not so unlike what has happened in the United States recently, except with actually using the army. Um, uh, he he learn he he's sitting in his barracks and outside of his window. He's a Bengali officer. There's 300 Bengalis on his base of a, of 1,500 people, and the Punjabis. Uh, declare that they are going to seize the armory, and he see, hears bullets going off right outside. Right, you know, he see, he he here he hears these shots being fired, and he realizes that he has to make a decision of whether or not he is going to stay sort of apolitical in the army or find out what's going on. And it's a you know it's a very exciting moment. I won't tell you how it turns out, but it's it's crushingly awesome. Uh, and you know these are the sorts of, of ways that we want to tell this story because it's not just the history of Pakistan and South Asia. It puts us into the moment and not only brings out um, you know what their experiences are, but puts sheds light on on really really broad based important geopolitical things that still affect us today. Uh, you know, and, and Jason, I'll let you tell about what those are. Sure. And and as you can see, yeah, we're, we're, we're far too excited about this book. You know, we spent 25 minutes now and we've probably gotten just through the first third of what the book is. Actually about. <laughs> um, but that, that's that, that's really the whole point, because the, the book was designed to bring in these stories that it's a mix of, you know, the most powerful and important leaders of the time and everyday people who all came together as this devolved into a case of genocide and war. And what is most important, uh, what we feel is perhaps the biggest takeaway is not just the relationship between uh, a storm and the conflict that it can generate, uh, but how everyday people can show hope and resilience against near impossible odds. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't have to do just with a just with a particular conflict, um, but it's also about our own role today mm -hmm. in trying to make some sort of positive impact uh, with the climate crisis. Uh, it's such a big issue. It's so complex. It feels so overwhelming. It can be really hard for us to to take more positive uh, feelings about it and, and take more ownership of it. Um, so that's, you know, so that's what the book is really trying to do is show 
that there is po the possibility for hope and resilience even in the darkest moments. Yeah. Uh, as, as Scott mentioned about the climate change and conflict link, what we really want to show in this book is that you know, there's no guarantee that a particular storm or a particular climactic event is going to cause conflict. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Effectively, it's a roll of the dice uh, where a storm might generate conflict. It really depends on what the political leaders do when it hits. Now, the problem today, of course, as, as, as we all know, is that because of the climate crisis, those dice are being rolled more often in more places and in newer places than ever before. So what we wanted to show in the book was that there are certain key moments after these storms hit that if we pay close enough attention to and give the right actors the right sort of support, it's less likely to lead to uh, a global conflict or, you know, as, as we saw in the, in the case of our book, uh, we were perhaps hours away from nuclear war. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, and, I think the, I'll just leave the last word to you, Scott. Yeah, and, and I think that the other thing that's really important here is, is, you know, since this is an allegory for climate change, right, we're telling history to talk about a, a, a problem that we're all going to face, where the, the, the problem isn't really only, you know, you know, you guys are in Miami. So it's not only losing coastline and flooding cities, it's actually the political fallout that comes out afterwards. But the really, the where the message of hope comes in for me at least, is that in the moments of, 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 of darkest crisis, individuals are faced with very specific challenges. Like right now, it seems like the problems of climate change are so abstract and big that no person could ever possibly do anything. But there is a moment where the those things don't become abstract anymore. It becomes obvious. It's facing you um, right in front of you and you know exactly what actions you have to take. And I think that we have this collective anxiety around climate change because we haven't yet felt that you know, those pressing changes just yet. We just sort of see them barreling down the horizon. But when they do come, there is a moment, this very precious moment where we have the ability to take action. And and humans, we just sort of know what that action is. Now, I can't tell you what it is going to be right now, but I do know that when Miami floods, right, there is going to be, that's not only going to be about putting sandbags up, in front of your house. It's going to be about making your government do something. And, and that's where the, where the rubber meets the road. That's where the stress meets actual act activity. And yeah, and so there is this moment of hope that I, that I think that, that we are not always cognizant of as Americans because we just see this abstract issue. But I promise you, it will get very real. And that is when our opportunity to act will, will sort of emerge. Um, so we can take questions. Let's do it. Let Christina. I love that. I love that. Thank you for ending on that note of hopefulness, because uh, it is it is rather huge, um, a topic. Um, so Sam would like to know: Can you talk about the research process and how you decided what details to include in the final product? Is there anything you had to leave out that you can share? Oh man. I also see, like, I also see, the, I think Sam has a, a second comment too, which we can kind of wrap in. Um, did you approach this book differently than you would an academic or investigative project? Um, so I can actually start with this, Scott, and then you can, uh, you can kind of dig in. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it was, of course, very, very interesting for me as an academic to work with, you know, Scott, an investigative journalist and author. Uh, we had complementary interests in the book, and I think they, they came out in the final product, but there were, of course, bumps along the way. Um, but what we did was, you know, this, there's a reason this, this book took five years to, you know, to write from start to finish. And the first is making sure that we had the research right. So we effectively wrote uh, or did research for a couple of years uh, as deep as we could to do um, everything that we would need to do for a typical history book from the period or a typical academic book from the period. Uh, and that, that included everything from going back to the, the Nixon tapes and listening to those for hundreds of hours uh, to researching old Urdu newspapers in West Pakistan uh, to a lot of primary interviews in Bengali and English in, in Bangladesh itself. 
But once we had, uh, so, so, and then I, I did a lot of that work to, to bring that together to figure out what sort of information we had. Uh, and then we also worked to tell the story in a more narrative way. And that's where Scott's amazing work really shined because then we were able to find characters who helped, who actually lived through these uh, bits of data that we found. Uh, and that was one of the hardest things is to find uh, find people who were, you know, ideally still alive today, who were able to share our, their stories with us and who had lived through multiple of these experiences as, as opposed to one or two. Uh, so it was a very long process that, that came together in the end in the book that you see today, uh, where it has very strong, very rigorous academic bones. But on the top of it, it reads like the, you know, the best investigative journalism piece that you'd read in a magazine. Yeah, that's always the trick with this sort of genre, right? And so actually I have a video coming out about this on my YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Um, so you should subscribe and whatnot. But the the the, the you know, what is narrative nonfiction? Like it's 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 this weird genre, right? Because we're trying to tell a true story. Like, you know, and and a true story could be like a police blotter on one end or like scientific research that no one wants to read for real because they doesn't doesn't have any analysis. And there's like sort of news stories and then there's historic history books and and, but narrative nonfiction is this very weird genre where you mix novel structure, right? The structure of novel, structure of Catcher in the Rye, uh, for instance. Um, and then you mix that with hardcore, everything is sourced. So when we have when we have quotes in the book, these are things that people actually said, and you have to paint the scene in a way that is as true to fact as possible, and yet people are going to want to read. And it's like, it's super tricky. Um, to manage in an honest, you know, way. And in the in the few places where we do condense timelines, we footnote that extensively. Well, endnote it. It doesn't actually interfere with the page, but we endnote it extensively to tell you how we or and why um, the decisions that we made um, were were you know, you know how how they frame that particular narrative and what the actual events were. And and that's probably the, the hardest part of this whole writing process is being sure that you you stay true to the entertainment value of the book as well as the um, you know the the academic rigor. And I will tell you that Jason and I just like we're we're fighting <laughs> quite frequently over exactly how to do that right because there's two you know he's an academic um, he's a stuffy boring academic and I am a schlocky journalist. And and how do you get those two places to meet in a way that um, that is going to to hold up? And I am I am so pleased that it came together um, so well. And, and, and the other just to address the other half of your question, is there anything that we left out of the final product? Yeah, like so much is left out. I mean, we're talking about a, a storm. This is a, a natural event and a genocide and like and just one event snowballing into another. I mean, the, the, the NPR today just said, um, you know, you know about the butterfly effect where a butterfly flaps its wings and eventually a, a storm happens off the coast of Florida. Um, this is like that, but uh, but switched on its head. This is the the cyclone flaps its wings and then the whole world goes mad. It's such a, it's a much bigger story and we only capture a tiny fraction. Luckily, there are lots of books uh, and sources out there that we cite in our book and, you know, lots of Bengali sources, lots of Bengali sources in English. So anyone could read them if they want to do a deeper dive. And I, I you know, I'd like to, to, to think that we are introducing a forgotten part of history to people so that they will be more interested to go deeper. That would be the, that would be the best outcome of this. Next question. Should we just look? Okay. We'll look. Um, how do you predict the future of climate change by looking at the past? Jason, that's all you. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I'll also um, I'll also address it alongside the question right below it too, which is, you know, talking about the political fallout that follows disaster. So most of the, you know, this is of course something that over the last 10 uh, and even particularly the last five years, uh, academics have really started to look at much more closely because the stakes are so high. 
uh, you know, we, we've seen things like this, but but also in many other places from, uh, you know, from Syria to Mozambique to Somalia, like where you see, uh, you know, weather events or climate events that can trigger a very large scale conflict. And, you know, once the conflict started, it's much harder to stop rather than to stop it in the first place. Um, so what we aim to do in the book, as I mentioned, was, of course, draw this this uh, timeline from where a storm happens and making specific uh, making specific points throughout the book where you can very easily see as a reader through the through the eyes of the people making these decisions where they could have taken a different turn and something totally different would have come mm -hmm. out of the end. Uh, and these sorts of causal relationships are what academics in particular are looking at today. Um, but you know, when when we look at these large scale quantitative analyses, uh, the best the best you can do is correlation because you can never prove that a storm caused a particular conflict. Right. But mm -hmm. you can see these patterns emerge that we also saw in the past 50 years ago, and also you know to a lesser extent to, in the Ethiopian famine of the 1980s, and in a, you know a half a dozen other events that have happened in the last 10 years. So the question then, of course, becomes, you know, what what does actually happen that triggers this? And the biggest uh, single predictor for conflict is how a political leader acts after a disaster. They can use it as a way to bring societies together or they can use it as a way to further right. push societies apart. Uh, and we saw this very much in Pakistan. And a lot of times it's driven by pre-existing uh, you know, ethnic divisions or other divisions within society. So, you know, so you have this exacerbated case that we talked about where it, uh, the storm hit and it only affected the Bengali part of the of Pakistan. So it made it very easy for Yahya Khan, who didn't really care about the Bengalis, to not care about the fallout of the storm. And mm -hmm. that's what set the chain in motion of the Bengalis all coming together, realizing that West Pakistan is not going to help them, even in their most dire moment. And then that's what triggered the back and forth that led to the conflict. Uh, and then it was the uh, partially due to the Cold War at the time, but partially, I mean, you can see this in Ukraine right now, where once a few countries start taking sides, everyone needs to take sides. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden, a uh, local conflict turns into a national one, turns into mm -hmm. a regional one, which can then turn into an international one. Uh, right. So it's those sorts of chains that we really want to stress and that the academic community in particular, looking at climate mm -hmm. conflict relationships, is most interested in, in uh, deciphering a little bit more so we can prevent these sorts of things in the future. Yeah. And when you look at what actually happened, you know, the this book ends at one of the most dangerous moments in human history, right? We're, we're at a point right now where we're looking at uh, what's happening in Ukraine, where Putin is like basically saying, I might start a nuclear war, which is pretty darn scary. Like I'm looking at the news wide eyed. I'm like, oh my God, I really don't want a nuclear war. That's going to, you know, that's going to do really bad thing. Climate change is nothing compared to nuclear war. And uh, we were at that precipice as well with uh, what the events we covered in the vortex. There's a moment in the end uh, where, you know, we know how it doesn't end. We know that we didn't get into nuclear war, but we have literally the Soviet fleet and the USS Enterprise that are the largest super carrier in our, in our task force, something that could like legitimately obliterate an entire nation all on its own. They're parked off the Bay of Bengal with a red line in the sea, not a literal red line, a red line put, uh, drawn on a map. And the Soviets have orders to vaporize the enterprise if they cross it, because this could be the next domino in our whole like Cold War insanity that we were in. And and uh, the, the 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 Soviet fleet's like, oh my God, this is where it's going to happen. And the captain of that flotilla issues an order that probably saved your life. You who are listening right now, it saved your life, which was, I am going to surface my subs in front of the enterprise, which is a tactically idiotic move. Like, you know, naval warfare, don't show your subs. That's like, you know, that's like 101. But he surfaces three submarines in front of the em enterprise, literally putting a line in front of it as a sign to say, do not cross, because if you cross, we have to shoot you. And if we start shooting, all of a sudden this goes from a cold war to a hot war. And Kissinger is saying to Nixon, we should just start lobbing nukes. 
And the only reason this doesn't happen, and which is maybe a, a, well, I, what I hope is an allegory to Ukraine, is uh, Dhaka falls to the rebels. The rebels win. The scrappy force, which was uh, funded by uh, you know international coalition of of foreign nations, um, it falls. And there's no reason to vaporize each other anymore. And that was just like really scary that we owe our lives to people like that guy uh, I mentioned, Hafez, and Muhammad Hai, who eventually becomes a pivotal player in this as well. Um, we owe our, our lives to these people who actually made that defeat happen. And that's why the vortex is so damned important. And you need to tell everyone you know after you read it and give us a five-star review and subscribe and like and all that internet bullshit. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's that. That's it. And there's no more questions. So, um, I mean, if you want to ask one, this is the time. Well, I have one. I just, um, you really made everything like come alive. So thank you. This is such an interesting conversation, such an interesting presentation. So, um, just a simple one. Why did you call it the vortex? <laughs> How did you land on that title? <laughs> Yeah, I know. We all, we all know titles are titles are tricky, and uh, and this is one where the you know we went through lots of different iterations of you know what what can mean a storm, but also this interaction of how all of these pieces started coming together, uh, and the vortex re represents, of course, the Great Bowl of Cyclone, but it also represents the way in this small conflict. Uh, started drawing in people from farther and farther away until nearly all of the world's great powers were involved in a place that, you know, I don't know, maybe Nixon could have found it on a map the year before, but he certainly didn't care about it. And that is, that's something that we really wanted to, to bring forward too, is like a lot of times we read about stories uh, about conflicts or storms or disasters in places that are far away. And we think, well, that's, you know, that's that sucks for them, but it's not that relevant for me. Whereas this is a case that something that happened in a faraway place that did, people didn't think too much about at the time, then created this event that the whole world sat up and paid attention to. Yeah. And the other reason why we chose the Vortex is because Gary Bass chose the better title of Blood Telegram and we couldn't use it um, because there was this important ambassador named Archer Blood who wrote a telegram to Nixon, which became known as the Blood Telegram uh, about why he was witnessing a genocide and Nixon was just ignoring this telegram. And that is sadly a better title. And um, we uh, are just, you know, beside ourselves that Gary Bass got to it first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a bad title at all. I like it a lot. I just wanted to hear more about it. So congratulations. Um, NPR's book of the day. We're like really happy to have this book on our shelves to be able to hand sell it to people. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for supporting Books and Books. Please come, you know, to Miami Book Fair if you can. In I'm November. excited. I'm going to yeah. send you an email right now. Good, good. Do that. Do that. And and truly, you know, thanks for your work and your dedication to all of these things and and actually illuminating them so that we can understand them. And definitely the world is, you know, becoming smaller and smaller to the point where everything we are interdependent. And I just hope mm -hmm. people begin to wake up to that fact. Um, so if you'd like to add any any final, you know, a summary, a final summary. I know. I mean, I, I, I just you know, encourage people to go read the book and um, tell people about the book if you if you do like it, because that is in this day and age, that is the hardest thing for any author to do. Like like those big media events, like I love the fact that we're on NPR and that's groovy and whatever, but that doesn't really matter compared to the individual experience of readers. And and, and we want you guys to, to feel as invested in these uh, topics as we are. And, and that's how people really find books is like you tell your friend and you're like, this was actually a really good book, you know? And, and, and that's where the excitement and that's where uh, you know, that's where we as authors are also most fulfilled. Like that's, that, that's, that's the, the whole game. So yeah. Well, thank you so your, much. your excitement is palpable and also <laughs> the, and your presentation as well, you know, it's really kind of, uh, you've made it all like, like I said, come alive. So thank you so much for that. And yes, you're absolutely right. It's just like one, one person at a mm -hmm. time reading mm -hmm. and recommending. 
is often how it works. So good luck. Thank you. To, yeah. to the vortex and may the force be with you. And oh, thank you. Live long and you... prosper. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's and thank you to uh, <laughs> and thank you to to all of our viewers for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's thank you. Bye. Have a great day. <laughs>